Peace and love, you beautiful people. It's your girl, Karina. Welcome back to the channel. And we continue our Lovecraft decoding journey, okay? Um, well, in episode eight, we journey into Dee's experience. And I really am ready to bring to you guys my um, addition to the conversation when it comes to this experience. And that's also why I have this t-shirt on, the New York Presbyterian t-shirt. Um, I've spent a lot of time here due to a family member and their mental illness. Mental illness runs in my family. And I do feel that Dee's journey is connected to her mental illness. But if we just stop here within the institution, then we may miss something really important when it comes to mental illness. So I'm going to discuss that. But before I do, I would like to journey back into my previous breakdown of episode seven in the I am and the etymology of Hippolyta. Okay, because there is something here that is connecting and I want to make those connections with you guys. So I hope that you will journey with me. And I'm going to need the help of this wonderful sister right here. So take a look at this little clip right y'all. I think the biggest thing for me was with the name thing, Hippolyta's name, right? And so we know that like the, the strongest thing that came to my mind was like the hippocampus. I'm always thinking of like <clears throat> the hippocampus, right? And what we know of the hippocampus is that it helps with the formation of new memories, right? And if you have a damaged hippocampus, you cannot form new memories it causes you to have amnesia, right? So when I think about Hippolyta's journey about the, in the I Am episode, it's perfect, makes perfect sense to hippocampus and Hippolyta because I think part of it being like, the formation of new memories and it rules the limbic system and things like this and emotions right and so when you look at the hippocampus being that it helps to form new memories and having hippolyta have felt like she had been shrinking right and that she was not being seen <clears throat> excuse me by the people around her to me that sounds like okay well you you have amnesia as to who you are I was honored to be invited onto DreamWise's channel to discuss Lovecraft Country this past Sunday. It was really unexpected, but it was quite exciting to do <laughs> and to share my theories with the connections to astrology. Um, but this uh, sister, Mook, she talked about the connection to the hippocampus and I really wanted to share with you guys the connection of the mind, the connection of what she's talking about with memory and remembering and how this too is also connected to mental illness or what I would call the fractured mind. One layer that is essential is understanding the symbolism of the mind. I'll take you back to Letty who um, buys a house and is dealing with situations <laughs> in the basement. Basement is that subconscious mind. Okay. And then when we look at Atticus, right? Because I, I spoke to you about how Atticus, when you break, when they nickname him, it's tick. So he is connected to the concept of time. And in astrology, what is the ruling zodiac? that rules over time, it's Capricorn, okay? And Capricorn, which is ruled by the planet Saturn, okay? And there are a lot of theories that Saturn was the first sun, right? So when we think about Hippolyta's journey with um, discovering the two suns, is, is this speaking about the current sun and the old sun, right? The current sun and Saturn? question mark. <laughs> um, so with Atticus being nicknamed Tick, he's connected to uh, Saturn and Capricorn. Those are the connections we can make. But we could also make it with his actual name because when we think about basement being the subconscious, right? It's still connected to the mind. When you think about attic in a house, right? 
it's the top. They both are kind of hinting to the mind, right? While the basement hints to the mind, the subconscious, the attic can hit, hint to the mind in the sense of the body. And on the body, the mind is the attic. So if the body is the house, then the mind could be the attic. What is the attic of the birth chart? So let me just pull this up for you. Switch this around. Oh, no, it doesn't. Here we go. Okay, so this is the birth chart. This is one depiction of the birth chart, one that isn't as popular because typically you'll see the zodiac signs and the planets. But what I have here is a bear um, chart. And this is actually showing you that the chart is based off of the hours, hours and Horus, right? The sun, God, Horus. And in the birth chart, noon could be considered the attic, right? Because the birth chart is also connected to the body. Every zodiac sign rules over the body, right? So the attic could be here, okay, at noon. And noon, right, this area of the 10th house is naturally Capricorn ruled, okay? It's naturally Capricorn ruled, all right, because we would start with, Aries here, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sag, Capricorn. Okay, so this right here would be the cusp of the 10th house, which is Capricorn ruled. So we make in the birth chart, right? So attic is the top of the body, which is the mind, but attic in the birth chart, meaning the top of the birth chart, but this is more of what I want to say about this. Okay. So you'll see here that Capricorn is here. When we're looking at a chart, actually, this is considered the North, the Northern Hemisphere. So now what you have to understand is that noon is actually considered the Southern Hemisphere. So in a lot of things that astrologers don't always make clear is that when they're reading a birth chart that is actually a, a little upside down upside down is how I'm gonna quote that <laughs> okay because um this is east this is west this is north northern hemisphere and this is the south southern hemisphere okay so we can also see that if the birth chart is upside down that instead of Capricorn being here, right? Or the attic being here. The attic is actually here. So Capricorn is here. What is here is Cancer, okay? This is Capricorn, this is Cancer. Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer. So the fourth and the 10th house, right? Represent a very pivotal moment in the seasons. So what does Cancer and Capricorn represent? They represent the winter and the summer sol solstice. So what happens on the summer solstice? At the summer solstice, the sun travels the longest path through the sky. And on that day, therefore, has the most daylight. When the summer solstice happens in the Northern Hemisphere, the North Pole is tilted about 23.4 degrees towards the sun. The day has also been celebrated in many cultures. So going back to this and in the previous uh, uh, breakdown where I talked about the four horsemen, right? It is my theory that if we apply the, the four horsemen to the astrology chart, that they would land on the cardinal cross. What is the cardinal cross? The cardinal cross are the four, sorry for my nail polish, <laughs> the four cardinal signs. What are the four cardinal signs? Aries, which would be here. Cancer, which would be here. Okay. Libra, which would be here. 
and Ca uh, Capricorn, which would be here. Okay. So it would be my theory that if we were to apply the four horsemen, that I would apply them as the cardinal cross. And what happens when you have a cross in astrology, you have opposition and you have squares. So you have challenges. So all four are similar in that they start something. They're catalysts. They start the seasons. Okay. The word horse, right, is connected to Horus, right? And so this could be because horse is also representative of the sun, the symbolic of the sun. This could be the eye of the sun, mind you. Corona eye, right? Sun, Horus. Horus, horse, but also whores connected to the concept of hoes, right? Because men could also be hoes. What I'm saying is that I felt like the women were the four horsemen because of the connection to whores, Horus, and horses, right? Hippolyta's name being a horse. So there's definitely that connection there to women. But the connection to men could also be there because Horus, the sun, and all men are sons, right? So it made me think of applying it from the male perspective in the sense that George, Montrose, Atticus. But then I was like, what is the fourth one? And I was like, well, maybe William, even though you know, if you've been watching the show, you'll know that William is really Christina, but that still kind of works out because I was watching Hood Mystic um, break down. And of course he casually says Christina's Christ. And I'm just like, yeah, Christ is also Jesus, which is also connected to the sun. So Christ is also the son, the son of God. So William's Christina posing as William could also be Christ, okay? Christ connected to the sun. So William could be the four horsemen, meaning George, Atticus, Montrose, and William. This is just a theory, but I'm finding the connection. So through the women, it's through the word horse. Through the men, it's through Horus. All together, they're the hours. Okay, so now we are going to go and journey into Dee's journey, but it still starts from this idea. It still starts from this um, astrology point of view that I'm sharing with, which is this, the Capricorn and Cancer, okay? So let's go to a, the Cancer symbol. So that is the Cancer symbol, yes. That's what a lot of people know the cancer symbol to be. But this is the astrology, astrological cancer symbol. You look at the cancer symbol, what else does it look like? Well, it looks like the six nine. Okay, so I wanna show you how the six nine is portrayed in our everyday world. This is Takashi six nine symbolism. Okay, and what does he kind of look like? Right? He's going to be our bridge here because his 6-9 energy and his 6-9 symbolism is the same exact symbolism as Cancer. But what does he look like? He looks like, right, he looks like a clown. Okay. And this is what brew Dee's story because... In Dee's story, she has, she is being chased by Topsy and Bobsy, I believe they're called, right? And they're both two portrayals of, they're both portrayals of a clown, okay? And there are theories and symbolisms that are connected to the clown that I'm not going to share here because it's not my expertise, but if you know it, I'd love for you to share. I beg you to please share down below. What also makes me think of Biden versus, we're going political here for a second, Biden versus Trump. During the debate, he says, don't listen to this clown. <laughs> okay. And Trump is a Gemini and Gemini represents the twins. So, um, 
And what we see with Topsy and Bobsy are the twins. Okay. So what is Gemini? Gemini is the devil and the angel. It's the twins. It's the two things that look alike, but they're very different or they represent different things. Right. And so that's what happens with these characters. So who is D? Who is D? Well, D, let's look at her etymology. Well, D is short for Diane or Diana. Right. Okay. And it could be pronounced actually, it says Arabic variation of the English name Diana is pronounced D-Y, Anna, Diana, or Diana, Diana, or Diana, right? So when you look at Di, what is a Di? A Di is a double. It says here that the definition of Di, the prefix of Di, is that it meant two, twice, or double. Okay, so Di, Anna, right, we're looking at a double, right? So she is looking at a double, which is also still Gemini energy, the twins, the doubles. But when we look at the etymology of Diana, Diana or Diane is a feminine given name derived from an Indo-European root word referring to divine, okay? And it is the name of the Roman goddess, Diana, the goddess of the hunt, the forests, and childbirth. Okay. The French form of the name is Diane. In Persian, Diana means supplier or messenger of beneficence and wellness, right? So when we think about wellness, that makes me think of mental wellness or mental illness. Now in mythology, right? Diana was an ancient Roman divinity, right? It's also known as divine, who came to be associated with the Greek god Artemis. So let's discuss Artemis because Diana in mythology is, is associated um, with Artemis. So Artemis is, again, the goddess of the hunt, the wilderness, wild animals, the moon, and chastity. The goddess Diana is her Roman equivalent. Artemis, in the Greek version, is the daughter of Zeus and Leto, and the twin sister of Apollo. And who is Apollo? Apollo, watch me run into your flames. Apollo, in Greek mythology, is the son of Zeus and Leto, and the twin brother of Artemis. He is the god of healing, medicine, archery, music, poetry, and the sun. Aha! Aha! <laughs> so Artemis, or Diana, is a Roman version of Artemis. Artemis being connected to the moon is the twin of the sun. So here they're sharing that um, her connection is connected to the moon, okay? Um, and also her connection is the concept of twins, right? The moon and the sun being two luminaries, the sun needing, the moon needing the sun's energy to be reflected. But the biggest thing here is the concept of the moon, because what we are finding also within Diana are demons. What are demons? Two, right? She is having two demonic energies. What are demons? Demons are of the moon. When we look at the word demon is D-E-M-O-N. Okay. D-E means of. M-O-N is also the moon. Just like on Monday. Monday is actually moon day. It just doesn't have the extra O in there. It doesn't have the twin O's. It just has the one O, but it's still connected to the moon. Demon is of the moon. So Diana being connected to Artemis, the moon, shows us that she is symbolic of the moon and of the demons, the entities that come from the moon, okay? This could also be, in astrology, all of the entities that are connected to the moon. We won't go too far in that, but let's think about Lilith, let's think about Rahu and Ketu, you know, certain entities that are connected to the moon. Okay. But I won't go that far right here. I just want to show you that 
what Diana is facing are her own inner demons. In fact, she's got twin demons, two things that look exactly the same, but they are opposite from one another. This is why I talked about mental health, because when you are seeing things that aren't there um, in mental health, that could be a significator of one of the mental health um, concepts is schizophrenia. Okay. Now, it could also be, you could also be hallucinating something, or you could also hallucinate demons if you are under a, um, you know, an agent like drugs that helps you to see something that's not there, okay, but it's still coming from you. So she had that agent happen with the cop, with the police that put something on her and made her see her demons. So is this a catalyst? from that or is it about her own mental health either way i want to make a connection to her being connected to the moon being connected to cancer the symbol of cancer and what we see in our everyday life right now right a symbol that is depending on how you look like it either showing you another entity of cancer or extorting the cancer um, symbol which is Takashi 69 because he uses the 69 symbol and that is connected to cancer and he portrays a clown and with Diana she is seeing twin clown like energies these two are these two what makes them actually really scary is the concept of the clown and that is kind of what they're portraying right so she is dealing with two clown demon like energies another movie that um, is very popular is it. It is also connected to clowns and clowns are connected to children and she is considered a child compared to the other characters. Okay. One of the things that really broke my heart is the fact that she's completely ignored. And I think that that is a part of the problem, but also part of the solution because she has to face her own demons by herself. And a lot of the times the children in the next generations are like the pawns in this everyday society, right? They're the pawns of dealing of the war that we're dealing with. And they just almost inherit the stuff that's going on. And that's part of the things that was really striking me about the episode that wasn't very pleasing at all. But what I would say about this is the concept of the fractured mind. And when we understand mental illness, um, we only see it from the place of illness. But in certain concepts like dealing with trauma, and I won't say that they use this directly, but the um, obey or ebay in Jamaica, right? And in Caribbean tribes uses this magic. And this is also connected to the twins, the fractured. It, to me, it's the fractured mind. Because when the mind is fractured, it can also, while cause a lot of trauma and a lot of physical distress onto the human, can also be a channel of the human in tapping into their abilities. And this is something that is solely mine perspective but I feel like there's a message that isn't being told about traumatizing people so that they can actually access or be a channel of abilities maybe even supernatural abilities or psychic abilities okay so that's something that I just wanted to put out there and, and contribute to the conversation about um Diana and her journey and what she's dealing with. And they're following her around there everywhere she goes. And she has to fight them and only she can see them, which shows you that it's coming from her own mind. But what I th found that is the overall umbrella of this entire um, episode is that it's based off of Emmett Till, right? Emmett Till was in that time also a child who was a pawn and, and sacrificed and used during this um, era and brutally killed and a representative, a symbol of what was going on in this era. 
but he was the next generation. He was the child of that era. And D or Di also represents that. We look at Christina. I just want to go to Christina because she actually gets killed in the form of Emmett Till, right? But Christina actually puts herself into the um, the form of William. Not in this episode, but Christ is put under the form of William. And when you look at the word William, the first thing I saw was um, millionaire, but then I also saw millennial. Right, because William turned upside down, just like the six nine is turned upside down, is millennial. So I also felt like there's a lot of connections with this episode overall to the concept of the next generation or the millennials, right, or the children of the millennials, um, because of how Christina actually kills herself, like Emmett Till, almost symbolically representing herself as being the next generation and the pain that they're going through. And if you look at it today, it's almost emulating that as well, that it's the youth and it's the next generation that are almost isolated, alone, ignored, and having to deal with their own demons, having to deal with their own pain, and also being pawns of the chaotic world that um, has been happening for centuries. Okay, so that is my breakdown of this episode, and I'd love to hear what you guys thought about it. Peace and love.